On this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by River Wind Casino, we give you the latest updates on the offensive side of the ball and the defensive side of the ball from OU spring practice. And then we give you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and rise to good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Easter Sunday, March 31st, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of April, all you got to do is visit Riverwind.com, Riverwind Casino, simply the best having a good Easter, Ted. We're kind of working it in. I'm hitting, we're recording during nap time. I had, I had mass. Then we had the brunch with my wife's side of the family. We've got dinner at our house with my, with my family. So this is, it's right in between. This is like my, my Easter break and we're recording. I love it. No, it's perfect. Uh, my wife cooked up an awesome lunch. We had some family over, some friends over. So it, the timing is perfect. I love it. I hope you guys had a fantastic Easter out there and everyone traveling. Hope you guys travel safe back to wherever you got to get to. Reminder, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment while you're at it. Also, if your business wants to advertise on the podcast, only got a couple slots left for football season. So email us quickly at the Oklahoma breakdown at gmail.com. Ted, we've been doing our roster breakdown, but we decided to put that on hold for some spring ball thoughts. And this is tied to, I, I was able to go to the scrimmage and we've seen the, probably the most media access we've ever seen for OU spring practice has been, you know, been able to read a lot of stuff from people there with those, see some videos from people or that those. So, Man, we got a we got a lot of stuff to talk about when it comes to what's happening on the practice field for the Sooners. Yeah, no, and uh, I'm excited about it because, gosh, it goes quick. I, they're probably getting close to the halfway point of spring football, so you're starting to get a little bit of a picture of maybe what some of those position battles and question marks are going to actually look like. This will make it feel like it's going quickly. The spring game's in three weeks. I know. Uh, it, it does feel like it's flying by. So let, let's get into some of this stuff. And I wanted to start on the offensive side of the ball. And, you know, when it went out to the scrimmage and I, I'm never going to dive into, you know, like plays they're running concepts, like that type of stuff. I, I don't want to get into all that, but the first defense looks good. I mean, I'm just going to be real. The, the, it, the offense, the first offense struggles to move the ball against the first defense. They just do. And Jackson Arnold didn't have a ton of time. Defense was playing the run really, really well. And now Jackson Arnold did have a couple really, really nice throws, especially one on the move that you just see just how talented he is. But other than that, man, defense was – the defense is looking the way that you hope it would look. Yeah. And – does the offense look as polished as you want it to look at this point in time? Probably not, but we were we were coming into this year going, the defense is going to be the strength of the team. This is going to be the best defense that Oklahoma's had in a long, long time, and that's kind of how it looks, man. Yeah, and, you know, if everything is equal, offense, defense, equal, returning starters, equal, all of that, the defense usually has the upper hand early in spring, early in training camp when they're going up against each other quite a bit. 
defense usually has a little bit of an edge. And then as the offense puts more in, starts to, you know, it's, we work on our offense and our defense, but they also scheme each other nonstop, right? Don't, don't get it twisted that they're only out there working on themselves. They're trying to win. It gets super competitive out there. So the, I expect the offense to catch up, but the other part of it, it's not equal. The defense has way more returning, you know, air quotes, starters or guys that have played a bunch of football. Um, offensively, we've got, you know, basically the entire tight end position is a totally new group of guys. Um, you do have some guys left from last year, but you know, the, the good rotation, new guys, wide receiver, same thing, clearly offensive line, several guys, and we got a new starting quarterback. Like there's a lot, it's going to take them a little bit to get up to speed, not to mention new offensive coordinator. They didn't reinvent the wheel offensively, but you know, there's going to be some differences that they got to get up to speed on. Yeah. Looking at, you know, sticking on the offensive side of the ball. I know that a lot of people are, are wondering what, what's the offensive line even going to look like. And just like it was when they let the media go out to practices last week, it was the same lineup, Tarquin, Ozida, Bates, Wee Woo, and Taylor. Now, Bates was in there at center because Everett went down last week, and, and we'll see how bad his knee injury is. Hopefully, it's nothing long-term, nothing too serious, but this is what I'll say. Wee Woo looks the part, man. Yeah. I mean, thick in his lower half. He's he's about my height, so he's not too tall. Like sometimes you can get get concerned about, you know, guards being six five, six six, that you know, with that type of size. I think he's he's basically built in a lab to be an offensive guard. He's about my height, so he's about six four, I'd say, maybe a hair under. And really thick lower half, super long arms. Sounds like Davin Joseph. He, I walked out immediately and went 54. Yep. That's what you wanted to look like. <laughs> and it didn't take me, you know, I was watching him an individual and then watching him the team stuff. He may be the best they've got, man. Yeah. And I, I just don't think there's any doubt that he'll be a starter because I, I was really impressed with the way that he moves, the physicality, you know, had it had an edge about him in the scrimmage. So I I really liked what I saw from him. And overall, just with what I saw, remember this is one practice. I think guard is probably the strength of the offensive line. Because I think Ozida, is that how you say it? Is it Ozeda or Ozida? I think Ozeda, but I go back I'm and not forth. Sure. <laughs> I do too. Heath. We'll call him Heath. <laughs> I I think he's got a chance to be really good. It, it's an interesting, he's got an interesting body type for a guard. He looks like a guy that would play tackle in the group of five. Like he he looks like a he's not small, he's a big guy, but he almost looks like a tackle playing guard. But I think he's going to be really, really solid for them. He just needs to get experience. Mm -hmm. uh, he just he needs to play, and that will help his confidence grow. But I was impressed with his technique. I thought his pad level was good you know, for a taller guy. He just – he's an athletic-looking dude, man. And that is – you know how I am mm -hmm. with athletic offensive linemen. He just – he looks like he should be starting along the offensive line at Oklahoma. I, I don't know how else other to put it than that. I, I just, I, I really liked what I saw at the guard spots for him. What's is he's like a three fifteen ish, isn't he? Yeah. I, yeah. I would say he's somewhere three ten, three fifteen. not fat. Looks yeah. good. Looks athletic. I, I know I keep talking about men's lower half, but hey, that's just that's football, man. It has a it's a nice lower half, you know, nice athletic build. I I think that part of getting over the hump as an offensive lineman, or at least this is how it was for me, is just 
gaining the confidence that you can block those guys. Yeah. And once you realize, hey, I can block these guys, you just it kind of you just settle down a little bit. Your anxiety drops. You're not so worried all the time about everything when you're like, okay, hey, I belong. I can block. And I think he he may have a little bit of that still going on, but he he looks like a guy that will start for this team in the fall. Like he just, he looks really really good. Yeah. But once again, I am very biased to the the athletic O lineman. Well, it sounds good, and and you're right, man. It, and it usually starts in spring after you've had a year or two under your belt, where it starts off with, you know. You have one or two good reps in a practice that tell you, hey, I can do it. And then maybe you have a good series. And then eventually you have a good period. And then before long, you know it, you, you're you having entire practices that are, for the most part, pretty solid. You start to build on it pretty quickly. So I think there's a lot of guys, which is promising, that are in that group where either they were – redshirt freshman a year ago or previously like the the younger part of this team there's a lot of guys in that position where you know they've got opportunities this spring and you're starting to hear guys take advantage of it on both sides of the ball yeah so it'll be interesting to see how the rest of that offensive line comes together i noticed you had taylor in there not sexton sexton i something's going on I didn't ask. I, I just, he doesn't look, he's not moving as fluidly as he did when he was playing his best at the end of the season last year. Hmm. So I don't know if there's something lingering there. Once again, I didn't ask, but I, I think he's, I, I think he's getting back from something, or at least that's how it looks gotcha. to me. Gotcha. And uh, Tarquin, I, I think he's a, if he's a guy, you got to start like in a pinch veteran guy technique solid just not a very he's just not a very big guy so yeah there, there's definitely question marks they need Everett to be healthy I think at this point in time he's their best option at center so I wish I could come on here and say hey everything looked incredible I I still have the utmost faith in Bill Beanbow to get that group right by the time they play a football game but yeah, some work is going to have to happen. And, and maybe maybe you got to go get a guy or two out of the portal during the spring window. It kind of reminds me of I think it was I think it was their very first spring when I think I think it was when Rain went down and they went and got Everett, right? Like they found out really quickly like we just we we have to have a backup center uh, even if like I don't know what what the situation is going to be with Everett whether he's he's back or not or you know hopefully he is like but even if it's just like a short-term injury sometimes whenever you miss a guy it's like okay we've got a clear spot where we've got to add some depth so maybe that and college football is just so different now you you can just address those needs so quickly so we'll We'll see, but, you know, I expect with what I saw, I expect that group to look a lot crisper and cleaner two weeks from now. And we'll see. But I've got some interesting observations from being out of practice. Okay. Dion Burks. And by the way, it's it's Ozida. I looked up the pronunciation guy. Heath Ozida. Ozida. Dion Burks. This is the comparison I'm going with. If Mark Clayton and Sterling Shepard had a baby, <laughs> it would look like Dion Burks. He okay. is, he's extremely explosive, man. He's not a big guy height wise, but he looks strong. Like he's built. Mm-hmm. The dude looks like a dang athlete now. And I just, I was really, really impressed just with the way that he moves and looks, looks like a veteran wide receiver. 
And I just, I think he's going to have an absolutely massive season. If the other pieces of the offense could come together, this guy is going to get open and he is going to make plays. Ted, he looks fantastic. I mean, he looks, he, he, not a huge guy, but he is, he just looks a little different than everyone else out there. Although the image is disturbing, you had me at Mark Clayton and Sterling Shepard. Uh, that's a, yeah, but that's you have to good. blend the two. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a, uh, that's the makings of a great wide receiver. Um, I'm, I'm everything we've heard mirrors what you just said. And I'm anxious to see, uh, how do they build on his strengths? Uh, do we see a, a portion of the offense that's kind of built around what all he can do to highlight him? in that slot position. Um, it's exciting. Tied in. I had a, I had a close eye on Bauer sharp. I, I just wanted to see, I, I wasn't, it didn't take me long to realize the guy can run. You only have to watch him run a couple of routes and you go, okay, that's an athletic guy at that size at 250 pounds to be able to run like that. Like he can run. He looks way thicker than I expected. He, he looks good. Yeah. But the thing I wanted to watch was, what's it looking like on zone insert? What What's he looking like at the point of attack in the run game? And I won't lie, man. I was, I was impressed. This is how I'll describe it. He's a very willing blocker. He's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize him as a punishing blocker, but he is willing. And from a physicality standpoint, the guy certainly is not scared to go mix it up, mm -hmm. which when you think about this dude was a quarterback a couple of years ago, I was very pleased with what I saw from him from a physicality standpoint. And he's only going to get better because Joe John does not play around with that stuff, right? Like you better be physical and mix it up if you're going to play tight end for him. So I know he's only going to get better from this point. And as he understands the offense more and all those things, but yeah, I I was pleased with what I saw from him just mixing it up in the run game, like trying to finish guys into the ground. Like he was, he took it seriously, which you see a lot of young tight ends or not even young tight ends, but just tight ends in general in college football that they just want to catch passes. It, it's clear to me that Bauer Sharp, he, he's a guy that's, He's going to do everything he needs to do at the tight end spot, which I was, I was really encouraged with what I saw from that standpoint. That's good. Um, you know, he's one of those pieces that we feel like, and in, in, again, it kind of falls back on, well, how do they, how do they use this position in the offense? And part of that is what are their capabilities there personnel wise? But, you know, we were, we were limited last year and, I hope this is something that we we build into the offense and, and use as a little bit more of a threat and, you know, play action game, some of the boot stuff and just your traditional drop back pass. I feel like we could, we could stand to get our tight ends involved. So it's good to hear that he's off to a good start in camp. Yeah. Jake Roberts wasn't out there, but I would assume that he's going to have a pretty significant role, just a veteran guy, but we'll, we'll see what I'm that looks like. Mitchell's just, you know, probably looks the part and is he's the best he's the best looking tight end it's not even close <laughs> but what's the best one he looks he looks like a true freshman yeah i mean he is physically impressive but what's the best way to put it his blocking is not exactly clinic take currently it's a different game you know you go from like in high school, the blocking uh, responsibilities at tight end, probably not a whole lot, probably catching passes and blocking small edge guys to having to block the most demanding spot. Those edge guys are all freaks. Biggest freaks easy. on the field. Yeah. That's a tough transition at tight end, but because of what he has athletically, I expect, I expect him to kind of get his feet under himself pretty quickly. He better. We need him he better. <laughs> we need yeah. him now. I, I was excited to see the Caleb Hicks. Man, he's definitely the most physically impressive back that they have. I keep talking about lower halves. Whoa. 
I mean, he looked good last year as a true freshman. He looks fantastic. And we, we'd heard some, what would you call it? Mixed reviews about how his camp had started here in spring ball, but had a couple of nice catches showed, showed his hands, shows ability to catch the ball out of the backfield, which I feel like has been an underutilized component of this offense. So now I just feel like something that, that, that is something that could really, really help. But man, Ted, he, it's not just about looking the part, but my goodness, he he is he is starting to look like a starting SEC running back. That's I mean that's just the type of dude he's starting to look like. That's good. That's that's what we need. Um, I know he's he's got like the perfect build to be able to do everything well. He's got breakaway speed, physical enough to run through tacklers, um, explosive for the short yardage stuff, strong. Yeah, I I guess it comes down to consistency for him. You know, can he block the right guy at the right time? Can he hang on to the football? Can he make the right reads and cuts and and not just do it once or twice, but put together practice after practice of of doing the right thing? I mean, apparently that's that's really been the only stuff holding him back. And he's young. He's got time. So it's good to hear that he's closing in on that. Last thing I got. From what I saw at practice, the player that flashed the most on the offense for me was Michael Hawkins, and I'm not even sure it's particularly close. Now, I was just really impressed. His fundamentals are good. He can rip it. I mean, deep outs pushing it down the field, even just getting the ball out to the flat, like that thing is on a line. Didn't make any critical mistakes from what I saw, and he can run. I mean, really run. And I I had to remind myself, like I was comparing – my expectations were, Hey, he's a freshman quarterback. He's going to make a ton of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so that was always in the back of my mind as I was watching him, but he didn't. And everything, everything looked good. And he appeared to have a really good feel of when to stay in the pocket, when to get out of the pocket, when to move to buy more time, did a good job keeping his eyes down the field, did a good job of knowing when the, hey, I got to take off, I got to get out of here. That I'm not sure what I was expecting from the young man, but he exceeded every expectation I would have of a freshman quarterback in a scrimmage setting in spring ball. I was wildly impressed, wildly impressed. That's great news. It's good to hear um, for a bunch of reasons. Like you, we got to have depth. I mean, we've we've found that out the last two years with Dylan Gabriel, right? What life is like without your starting quarterback. Um, so you have to have you have to have really good options there. And it sounds like we're off to a good start with Hawkins. And yeah, physically, some of the tools that he's he's got are really impressive. And when you can run, I it it always helps to have that in your back pocket and. It sounds like as a young guy, like a lot of young quarterbacks that can run really well, rely on it. And it sounds like it's not, he, he doesn't necessarily, he's not always looking to run, which is a good thing. Knows yeah. when to, when to use it, when not to. Yeah. I think clearly his dad, like they've been, he's been working for a long time to play quarterback at a high level. And clearly all that work that they put in has paid off. It is as impressed with the freshman quarterback as I have ever been since I started doing the radio broadcast. It's not even close. Okay. And that includes Caleb Williams. Just watch it. You got to factor in early in spring practice. I mean, if you would have said, hey, how old do you think that guy is? I would have I probably would have said that it's at least his third year. 
with the way he's operating the offense, how comfortable he looked. The guy was having a ton of fun, too. I mean, I loved everything I saw from the kid. Okay. Am well, I being too complimentary? I feel like maybe no. I'm laying it on thick. But I was, what dude, I was what really, really I mean, impressed. Well, I'm going to go ahead and ask what everyone that's listening to the pod is thinking. Do we have any type of quarterback battle going on for the number one spot? You know that's the natural question and the, and the natural progression here. I don't think it's fair to compare. Hawkins had better protection than Jackson Arnold. Yeah. He, one, one versus two defense is a big step. Yes, but I, I think that I walked away from it going, Listen, if if that kid's got to play, yeah, he'll make some freshman mistakes, but I feel good about him going out there. But that's, that's how good, good he looked to me. So yeah. I'm not falling into your 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 trap here. <laughs> I'm, hey, I, that's that's a due diligence question there. If you watched, if you would watch the scrimmage, you would go, you would walk away going, "Who is number nine? Yeah. That guy's got like that's just I don't know how anyone could watch that scrimmage and that not be one of the main, if not the main takeaway for from what you saw from the offense. No, I have not been out there yet, but that echoes what I've heard from the people I've talked to that have been. You want to talk about some of the stuff on defense? Sure. Absolutely. But first. Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode to the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Love's Connect app unlocks exclusive deals and help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Love's Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Love's Travel Stops. Loves All says you've covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hummery. And celebrate with a Schooner All American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Aleworks. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice cold beer from Coop Aleworks. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletic Events, at the bar, at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit schoonerale.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. And we love Simple Modern. Simple Modern is an Oklahoma-owned drinkware company who launched the best cups it's ever made with its new signature line this month. They're 100% leak-proof, which is what everyone needs with an on-the-go cup, and it has a ceramic coating on the top of the double-insulated stainless steel to preserve the beverage's taste while still keeping it cold and hot for hours. And even better, Simple Modern exists to give generously, donating 10% of all profits. So you can know you are helping better Oklahoma and beyond with every purchase. Check it all out at simplemodern.com today. No headset for BV. How about that? At all. Calm him down some over there. Is he able to, uh, to move around a little bit more? Just standing in the back. As calm as I've ever seen him, observing, lurking. <laughs> There's a thing here, there where he he'd enter the mix, but it was Zach Alley's show on defense. Now, that's good. Who knows what it looks like once games are being played? Okay, but from what I could just tell, observing, everyone was looking to Zach Alley for what they were doing on defense. Now, of course, Venables was teaching when, when, you know, a series would end. He was teaching, he was pulling the guys aside, going through things, you know, doing what he does. But I think that's been, you know, we've all been wondering, hey, is is he going to be able to have his hand in more things and let Ali take control of defense? And unless I'm just missing something, that's the way it looked to me. Yeah. Which I think is a good thing, Ted. No, I, I agree 100%. Um... 
and this this kind of goes to what we've been talking about uh, again i i didn't and still don't know a whole lot about zach alley but because of his time with with coach venables in clemson and mirroring him and and you know for lack of a better term being his his gopher uh for the last however many years we hoped it was going to be a seamless transition expected it to be a seamless transition and that's what you're explaining to me sounds exactly like what we had hoped it would be right just comes in able to pick right up not not a whole much of a of a learning period or acclimation period for him it's like he's been able to kind of take it and run with it and the players seem to really like Zach Alley. Now, the defense was also playing really, really well throughout the scrimmage, but a lot of celebrating with him. I don't know. Just I liked what I saw from, you know, me. I'm a vibes guy. Mm -hmm. the, the vibes on defense and with, with Zach Alley having control. Of it, I don't know. This seemed really good. Which I which I thought was very very encouraging. I like Grayson Halton. I like him a lot, and I need him to gain more weight. Yeah, we liked him from the very first time we saw him as a true freshman. He, for me, flashed the most out of any defensive lineman, edge or interior. Made some big plays, tackles for loss, sack, like he, he's got quickness. He's got twitch, suddenness, whatever word you want to use. I, I think he's got a, he's got a natural ability to know when to hit that inside move, right? When you catch the guard or the center lean it, like he's, he's got some instincts that I think are hard to teach, but he, he plays with solid pad level. He's just got, he's got to be heavier. I stood right next to him. He has to gain weight because you're, you're going to be able to make some of those plays just with your, with your quickness, with good technique, with, with your anticipation. Like He'll be able to make plays, but can he hold up to Bama running duo at him 16 times in a game? Mm-hmm. You have to be able to do it all, man, as a starting defensive tackle in the SEC. You got to be able to do both. So I think from a production standpoint, you know, from making impact plays, I think he's the top defensive tackle. I do. But he's got to be heavier so that he can do the boring things of the position at a higher level. Just being able to hold point. Just got it. When they're trying to double team you on a gap scheme, you you just can't get washed, man. Mm -hmm. For so, it doesn't matter how if you have a TFL every game, but you're getting pushed off the ball, you know, fifty percent of the time because you just don't have the weight. If he can get that, man. If he can get to three hundred pounds, I. I, I he think he can now? be a What's really good player. I think he's 85, 80? Somewhere, I, I would say somewhere around 85 is yeah. my guess. If yeah. he can add weight, man, he's going to be just fine because he flashes. He's He's got that suddenness, that twitch that you're looking for in, in, in a three technique. And I, I like it if – I would prefer it if a guy starts too light. Yes. And then puts on weight. Absolutely. Because you, as the smaller you are, you have to play low. You have to have great technique. Uh, it's just, it's a little bit different. If you've always been the biggest guy, tend to play high. And so I, I, it's a good starting point, but you know, we're like three years down the road now, you know, it's, it's, this is the way I see it. And, I, I feel I am uniquely qualified to talk about this. How much does it mean to you? Because if it means a lot to you, you'll add the weight. It meant a lot to me. 
I did not want to sit on the sideline and not play. That sounded awful to me. So what did I do? I gained as much weight. Probably not the smartest way to go about it at some time, but I, I did what I had to do to hit the weights that Schmitty wanted me to be at so I could be on the field. Yeah. And there is no reason that Grayson Halton shouldn't be at 295 at the very least when they kick this thing off in the fall, if it yeah. means something to him. So I, I like the guy. I mean, he makes plays every time I'm out there. He makes plays. But you have to be able to hold up when they're just running power at you. Yeah. You you got to be able to play. You got to be able to do that part of the position as well. It's just not rushing the passer and beating guys with a quick inside swim and making a TFL when they're running zone. Like it, those things are great, but there's more to playing defensive tackle than that. You got to be able to do it all. I agree. I I'm I'm hopeful though. I mean, it, it's he's got a great motor. He can run too. Like yeah, not just playing in the in the box like on um, perimeter stuff. He gets out. He runs well. So you know he's he's really explosive. So I hope he gets there. I mean, it's good to hear that he's he's continuing to progress as far as the technique and the production and stuff like that. Just get that weight up, man. He looked good. Now he did not look good as David Stone. <laughs> he he may be the best looking defensive lineman on the entire team already. Hmm. Arms are long. Here I go again. Lower yeah. half is thick. He has. He's got a long way to go with his fundamentals. He's got a long way to go, right to when it comes to learning the the finer things about playing interior defensive line at this level. But damn, he looks good in the jersey. <laughs> I mean, he just does, man. There's no other way to see it. Jaden Jackson, at this point, he he does not have he doesn't have anywhere near the ceiling that Stone has just because of the the physical intangibles. Right. Yeah. The traits, right? We talk about traits a lot when the NFL draft rolls around, but right now, Jaden Jackson, he's just a better player. Strong. I was, cause I was watching him closely because we'd heard so many good things about him. First of all, is he, is he wearing 65 against his will? I don't know. We got to get the guy a better number because he, <laughs> he may start at the very least. He's going to be a rotation guy as a true freshman. He's that good. Hey, what is he? He two ninety five, two ninety. I would say, yeah, I would say he's somewhere in that range. Yeah, but he is. He's got really good technique, pad level, hand usage. Uh, clearly, it looks looks strong. I was really pleased with the way that he held up at the point of attack, and he's going to get stronger. He's going to get heavier. He's going to get better before the season. I will be, with what I saw, I'll be really surprised if he's not in the defensive tackle rotation. That's good. He's good at getting off blocks. Uses his hands well, which that's usually the biggest issue with young interior defensive linemen is the hand usage stuff. Yeah. He uses them well. Shot, shed, like he's he's solid. Convert. He, he did a nice job of converting some pass rushes. I... I get why why we've been told some of the things that we've been told. Yeah. Well, it's good. It's good to see some of the young guys looking good. And, I mean, i probably going to see both of those freshmen be pretty big contributors, I'm guessing, right? If things continue to progress like they have so far. I would assume that Stone's technique is going to come a long way with the back half of spring ball. And then the summer is really a good time to sharpen that type of stuff. Yep. Now you only get, as the old saying goes, you usually only get better at football playing football, but when it comes to hand usage and all that, so I think he can work on a lot of that stuff during the summer, but the physical tools, 
look like they are there. So if he can just kind of sharpen that other stuff, I think he's going to be just fine. But Jaden Jackson's the guy that, of those two right now, that is the standout. That's good. I like it. Jaden Hardy. That guy can run, and that guy can track the football. And that guy was running with the ones. Hmm. Okay. Now, Billy Bowman has missed some time. I'm not worried about it. But Hardy made some nice plays. Kind of weird seeing a defensive back wear 14 back there. I I instantly, I was like, is that Aaron Colvin? <laughs> But he, it, it's not easy to play safety in this defense as a true freshman, Ted. You know that. Oh, no. And he was, I mean, it looked like he was holding his own just fine. So that is, that's impressive stuff that he's already getting thrown in the fire like that. And, and we'll see if he ends up playing significant snaps. But look at, look at Hardy out there already. I, I mean, that that's a big deal. Early enrollee yep. out there already, first group, first defense. Yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. It there's so much that goes on at safety rotations and how you adjust every motion and replace player and blitzes or blitzes that have you dialed into them and run fits and there's a lot going on at safety. So. To see a freshman come in and be able to grab it that quickly and and have some success and like usually at the thinking position, safety and backer, you usually see guys like because of the the weight of all the mental juggling going on, that the athleticism is is not showing like it should. So you got a true freshman out there that's going through all of that and still able to make those flashes with the athleticism. That's impressive. No doubt. You're going to love Lewis Carter so much. Good I know you already yeah. love him. Yeah. It's, it's strange to watch him out there. It, it's because Stutzman's so tall and he's standing next to him. And you're just like, why do they have a running back playing inside backer? He <laughs> looks exactly like a starting running back. I mean, that's how he's built, but that guy is, I mean, this is the biggest compliment you can give an inside backer. That guy is a fan of contact. I mean, yeah. my goodness. And he is fast. He is explosive and he's got great instincts. And whenever he, when he pulls the trigger, man, whew, he can go. And I, from the stuff that I've seen, and I haven't been out there yet this year, but he's he's just a violent player. You know, some of those guys, it's like, even on what looks like a routine tackle, they, the ability to just snap the hips and run the feet makes everything just look explosive. It's, it's a great trait to have. There was a few where he makes a play and the player he hit was like, I need a second. <laughs> Give him the old tap. No, it was I more like the arm hanging, not the, uh, <laughs> not, not a, not a, oh, I'm seeing star situation. Like that guy just hit me and it feels like I just got hit by a bus. Wow. Like, hey, the arm, the arm needs, needs to regain a little feeling. It was, <laughs> it was pretty interesting. But yeah, that's yeah. just some Bittles of the stuff. Is, he's loved him from the very beginning. You know, whenever he was recruiting him in Florida, remember, he was a four-star player out of the state of Florida and Venables said that he's the best player in Florida at the time. And I, I, so he doesn't say that on nothing. I mean, that's, that is a huge compliment. And every time he's talked about him since he's been here, you can see his eyes light up. Like he knows it's coming. Yeah. All right. Let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, all you grill masters, listen up. Didier Ranch delivers premium quality beef that is 100% raised in Oklahoma right to your front door. Go to DidierRanch.com, D-I-D-I-E-R, Ranch.com to order one of their premium quality beef boxes 
and use promo code OKLAHOMA15 for 15% off your order. Filet, ribeye, New York strip, sirloin, steak burgers, they've got it all, and they ship anywhere in the continental U.S., and Oklahomans can get deliveries in just one to two days. The only thing better than having a lot of premium beef on the O&D line is having premium beef delivered right to your front door. Diddy or Ranch, tradition tastes better. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter, toasted buns, and some ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. With all the garage locations being open at 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? Well, I had to start off a little bit with DeMarco Murray. Got a uh, a nice four-star running back commit, Tory Blaylock out of Humble, Texas. Um, you'll like this, Gabe. Uh, at his announcement, he... Uh, he did the Ohio State hat pickup fake, and then he grabbed the Texas hat and put it on and had it on for a good, like, 10 seconds and had everyone in the room standing and applauding and everything, and then dumped it and went with the Oklahoma hat really late. So um, so he understands the rivalry. I love <laughs> it. it. Already he trolling Texas it. fans. Way to go, Tori. Yeah, so uh, we've added, added a, another good running back for the future there. In uh, in Tory Blaylock, but how about this? Alabama uh, threatening to become a basketball school with the departure of Nick Saban makes their first ever Final Four. How about that? Just what Alabama fans needed: more success. <laughs> awesome. No, they were. I watched all that game. They were impressive. Yep. They were really impressive. And how do you feel about Nate Oates? I, f- I find him very likable. Is it just me? No, I don't. I I think I like him. He's he's, why well, he's at the, he's at the limits of what I like before it becomes too much. You know, what's the coach's name at Arkansas? Like that guy's too much for me. Muscleman, the Muscleman. must bus. Mus- Muscleman's way too much for me. Oates is like he's 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 my limit for for how much I could without going over the top. I don't mind him. I like him. Mark Sears you? had himself a game in that. Woo. I did you see the post game interview? No. He basically said, "I'm only six one, man. I'm not. I wasn't that big of a deal, but I could, this is awesome. <laughs> it was it was. <laughs> I don't know. He just seemed he said so genuinely." happy and he was massive him and pringle were both huge for them in that game and unfortunately the i don't think you could call clemson a cinderella i guess you could if you wanted to but their their run comes to the end via the hand of the tide yeah of all people to match up against i bet clemson is like dang man crap well i don't know pretty exciting though for alabama to get their uh their first Final Four ever. That's that's uh, that's interesting. But congratulations to them. The basketball program is it's been on a rocket ship since Oates got there, and they've got the new arena coming at some point, right? So, uh, big stuff at Alabama. Just what Alabama needed. <laughs> More success. That Stevenson kid came off the get the bench. I think I think he's a freshman too. He was. He had like 20. They had they got some big time contributions from multiple guys that maybe I'd, I I thought they were going to win that game, but it kind of just unfolded in an interesting way. But I just – I find it very, very difficult to cheer for Alabama in anything. <laughs> I understand. I, I like understand. Nate Oates, though. I do. But I just find it – I I wasn't overjoyed for them when the when the clock hit zero. Uh, very understandable. Very understandable. I can't yeah, believe I, you did them. Ugh. I know. Hey, you got to call it call it how it is. Call it how it is. They are a winner. Winner of the as, weekend. As as you know, I like to predict who you're gonna who you're gonna do. 
I really thought you were going to do OU softball for what was it a 17 to nothing win against Kansas. That was, I felt bad. That was such a beat down. I know it was like, it's five Oh after the first, Oh, it's 10 Oh after the second. I mean, it just kept like, uh, kept growing and growing. So, Hey, you know, you know how it is with softball. Like, unfortunately, this is just how it is. It's kind of built in, you know, the expectation things just kind of built in. Now they do have the big Texas series this week in Austin, right? Yeah. So I'm sure that's going to make the list. I, I would imagine we will, uh, we'll talk about that on here. Who do you have as your loser of the weekend? I guess I got to go with Rasheed Rice. Chiefs wide receiver. Um, I don't know what was going on. Maybe a little street racing or something down there in the, uh, the Metro racing a Lamborghini. I guess they said, I don't know. He bounced from the scene, but there was a multi-car accident. It sounds like a Corvette and a Lamborghini were racing. Corvettes registered to his name. Uh, it was a big accident. Send at least one person to the hospital. Um, but he's nowhere to be found. So it sounds like he, uh, he bolted from the scene. Perhaps. I hate everything about this story. I know it. Just why? Why? Well, you know, fast cars are, it's a dangerous thing, man, because whenever you have a lot of money, you instantly have access to a lot of these vehicles. And I'm not going to say that there's like some extremely high bar of being able to drive them, but it's not like you step in ever having never driven anything like that before and not getting into something incredibly dangerous. It It is incredibly dangerous, not just for yourself, but for everyone out on the road, whenever you're racing on a highway that's occupied by a bunch of, you know, just regular drivers, which I guess I, I can't say that they were racing, but whenever you hear a Lamborghini and Corvette, you know, are both spinning into the wall. Yeah. Causing a chain reaction crash. Right. For, what four other cars? It was like at six o'clock in, in the evening too. 6 20 PM local time. That's Not a weird a time, time to race. Yeah, especially in in the Dallas Metro, it's not exactly a ghost town at six o'clock on a Saturday night. I wonder. I mean, as far as I know, he's not facing any charges yet, but the Chiefs cannot be pleased. No. Already not. It's not like the... uh, the toasted position on the, on the football team at the moment. So yeah. And and that's my thing for him is he, he just had this awesome playoff run where people are starting to talk about him being the number one guy possibly for them next season. And you go and do that. Make it make sense, man. That's where I just, some of this stuff is baffling. Well, let's just hope that whoever was injured is okay. And this is something that he learns from, you know, it's, we all make mistakes. It's, it's how we respond to him. Hopefully he, he's able to learn from this. And I don't even know what all the details are, but we've seen some bad stuff in the past. Whenever it comes to racing vehicles, driving fast, I, it's, I mean, we're just talking in the football world, obviously, I, this is not an uncommon thing, unfortunately. Uh, but even in the football world, we've, we've had some really, really bad things happen. Yeah. Recently. Uh, I mean, the Georgia, let's not forget the Georgia situation. Not that long ago, man. Yeah. So I, I just don't get it. I'm not a car guy though. I've never had a desire to drive fast maybe i just don't get it maybe i'm boring i don't know you are you're boring okay that's fair (laughs) that's fair (laughs) let's finish up with my winner and loser but first 
All right, listen up, Oklahoma sports fans. Don't miss your chance to meet some local star athletes and support our state. Join OU legend Sterling Shepard, OU pitcher Kelly Maxwell, and Hooper Peyton Verlost and more at the Oklahoma State Capitol on April 8th for the American Heart Association's Rally Day. They're rallying for crucial legislation to ensure cardiac emergency plans are in place at schools across Oklahoma. Every year, thousands of young athletes and fans across the country suffer from sudden cardiac arrest. Having proper emergency plans in place saves lives. So mark your calendar for April 8th to rally with Sterling Shepard at the Oklahoma State Capitol. Visit heart.org slash Oklahoma for more information. And attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to opolisclothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. For my winner of the weekend, thought about going with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Now, we are recording this before they play the Knicks in New York city, but no matter what happens in that game, nothing can take away the joy that the look of disappointment on Kevin Durant's face brought me on Friday night. Sun's just the, the vibes are not good. A 25 point beat down without Shay. Wow. And remember the Suns are trying to avoid the play in and they just could not hang with the thunder. Uh, so many guys played well. Giddy has found it. Yeah. Chet, March, was, right? Chet was really good on both ends of the floor. Jada, Aaron Wiggins had a really nice game. Isaiah Joe, awesome first half. Like Case Wallace. It was just a really nice performance overall. And Kevin Durant looked so sad, and it made me so happy. Now, I am... I wasn't one of the people booing every time he had the ball. I, I'm not quite at that level of disdain for him, but seeing how disappointed he was that they couldn't beat the Thunder without Shea, and not only could they not beat him, they got destroyed. Yeah, it's it brought me a lot of joy. <sighs> That's good. Yep, it's um, it's awesome to see this this team come of age and. The depth, the young guys that play well off the bench. Yeah, and, and those big, those wins are big here coming down the stretch, man. I That was a fun one. That was a really fun one. Had a few beverages. Was talking to a couple of the Suns guys, uh, David Roddy and Ish Wainwright. Perfect example. Should be in football pads. Had a long <laughs> conversation with Ish Wainwright about it. He actually, he played it Baylor and then he tried to make the bills. Really? It was telling me about it. Yeah, I didn't. And I said, dude, you should have stuck with it. Like you just gave it. I was like, well, I went and played overseas and then God must be a hell of an athlete, no <laughs> but kidding. jump around to professional leagues and figure out where you're going to, uh, sort it out. Wow. Yeah. Fun conversation. It sometimes the basketball guys get offended when I say that. And sometimes they really like to engage in the conversation. And both of those guys were like, I, bro, I know all you football guys say the same stuff. Like, That's I'm just funny. saying, I'm just saying, but my winner of the weekend, UConn, what a wagon. No kidding. It, and it kind of looked like they were going to blow them out early. What well, jumped out to that nine Oh lead. And it just felt like Illinois maybe was completely outmatched, but then they settled in. It was a very competitive first half. It was an ugly first half. No one could hit a damn shot, but it was close. It was competitive. And then the second half, whoa. Wow. Just 
dismantled them. And, and remember, the game was tied at 23 in the first half. And at one point, UConn was leading 53 to 23 in the second half. <laughs> yeah. 30 30 uh... 0 run. Jeez. In an Elite Eight game. That's that is the worst feeling ever for the guys out there on the floor, just watching it all not slip away, I guess, run away at a very high rate of speed. I I felt bad. Stan Van Gundy on the call at one point, he, he said it out loud. He said what we were all were thinking. He goes, is Illinois even going to score in this half? <laughs> but I, I really enjoy watching UConn play. Clearly, they got a bunch of guys that are going to play in the NBA, which is part of it. But watching them on the offensive end of the floor is there's so much movement, so many different sets, so many different actions, guys sharing the basketball, cutting without the ball. The spacing is great. It's just, it's high level stuff. Man, I've heard people talk about the, you know, how extensive Hurley's playbook is for all that stuff. Well, Whatever he's doing, man, it is, it's fun to watch. And all of a sudden you look up and they've won 10 straight NCAA tournament games by double digits. It's crazy. That's wild. I mean, it's shaping up to be a, uh, a nice final four, but they're, they're looking like, uh, they may be the unstoppable force. Playing in was awesome. I mean, rebounds, blocks, finishing at the rim, ended up with 22, 10, and five. I think he had three steals mm. also. That's, that five is five blocks. And I feel like he had more than that. It felt like he had more than that. It felt like Illinois just stopped going to the rim because they just couldn't score on him. And Terrence Shannon had to have a massive day Like going into that game, it's like Terrence Shannon has to be the best player on the floor for Illinois to have a chance. And he just didn't, he didn't have a good game. I think ended up with eight points, something like that. It just, UConn choked the life out of him in the second half. It was good. They're good. But I just wanted to be entertained, but I did get to get some. What once I realized the game was. Once it got to about 18 or 20, I was like, okay, I can get some things done (laughs) during the second half of this game because this thing is over. Yeah. Started doing some Easter, Easter prep. And then it became, okay, how long is this, uh, how long is this 30 point run going to go? Yeah. UConn. It's looking like back to back. Now we'll see. Hey, maybe Bama, maybe Bama can hit enough threes. That's Steve. That's the ultimate equalizer in this sport right now. If, if you can go out there and you can shoot the three at a high level, we'll see. But yeah, UConn, it, it looks like they're head and shoulders the best team. But we'll see next weekend. Now, for my loser of the weekend, uh, thought about going with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Have you seen this? No, I don't think so. So clearly they have a very exciting team. Tied right now with the Thunder, as we record this, tied right now with the Thunder uh, for the best team in the West, or best record in the West. We'll see when Carl Anthony Towns is able to get back. I would say Anthony Edwards is one of, when you think about young players in the league, probably one of the top five guys you'd want to build a team around. Under the age of 25. They were, remember, that their owner, Glenn Taylor, sold the team to A-Rod and Mark Lloyd, like to that group. Well, this week, Glenn Taylor basically said they have not met their financial obligations, not selling. Hmm. Well, A-Rod and Lori came out and said, we did everything you asked us to do. We raised the money. You're trying to back out of the deal. It seems like it's going to get messy. Yeah. Not exactly what you're looking for when you're trying to compete 
for a title this season. No. No, that's a – I guess, like, if you've got a good locker room, I mean, it – really, you should be able to, uh, you know, keep that aside and stay focused. But it is something that's hanging around, and I don't know. It That's – it's weird whenever things get to this because I, it's not like you can just go out there and make some statement. I, if it's like not true and they have tried to do everything that in the contract that they're supposed to do, I, and you just go out there and make that claim. I don't know. It's weird. I don't know how that happens. I mean, sometimes it's a fact like, Hey, we had a contract. Here's some of the benchmarks they had to meet to get this deal moving and to get closed. And if they haven't, done that then you know what are you going to say about it but whenever they're saying that yeah we have done that it's just strange there are a lot of people that look at what what the team was sold for and now what the team's valuation is and they think glenn taylor may be just trying he's got some seller's remorse yeah so we'll undervalued it yeah, we'll we'll see how it plays out, but it's it's one of the more interesting sports business dramas I can remember. I, I I'm really interested to see how it plays out. No, I I agree. It's these saying these deals are always fascinating because it's a ton of money. There's a ton of details involved. Like there's so many moving parts and it takes the deals forever to get done. I'm uh, I'm fascinated to learn what the uh, what the real issues going on are. Me too. But my loser of the weekend. All you people that don't like watching Caitlin Clark, <laughs> you think she gets too much coverage, you're tired of people talking about her, well, you better just not watch TV for the next couple of days. Because the Caitlin Clark haters are the loser of the weekend. Iowa smacked Colorado. Watched a ton of that game. Uh, really put it on them. And, you know, one by 20 plus to advance to the Elite Eight. Now, Caitlin Clark, she she missed a lot of threes in the game. But ended up with 29, 15 assists, and six rebounds. And, and it wasn't just her. All five starters for Iowa were all in double digits. P- played a really, really nice game. And, and the... The Caitlin Clark train continues to roll, but we got the matchup in the Elite Eight. I know it. The rematch, if you are if you're one of those people that is annoyed by the amount of Caitlin Clark coverage, just wait because LSU Iowa Monday night. Rematch of the title game from a year ago. You got the Kim Mulkey stuff as well. Angel Reese is the other, you know, one of the other big stars in the sport this is this thing's gonna get a ton of coverage it is gonna be a big deal on monday night on espn so i hope we get a classic when you look at the game and one other name to know flo J. johnson not only can she rap she can absolutely hoop for lsu so there could be a ton of storylines and if you are if you're over the caitlin clark thing then you better you better avoid <laughs> avoid sports television for the next 48 hours it's it's funny it's like uh it's like caitlin clark and angel reese switched spots last year i angel reese had all the haters at this point and caitlin clark and iowa had all the backers now i don't know who has the most haters now lsu or iowa i i don't know all i know is that uh, millions of people are going to watch that basketball game. It's going to do a huge number. Yep, it is. It's it's going to be the number it did last year was was massive, and it's going to be can't miss hoops again on on Monday night. It's uh, well, you know, which part of me like Caitlin Clark has a bunch bunch of haters. Obviously, that's what happens whenever you have a lot of success. But it's not like. She went to Iowa looking for a ton of attention, right? That's not where you go if you're looking for a ton of attention. It's just like ESPN and and the the networks see that they've got a star and they just bombard you with it until everyone can't stand it anymore. And like they prop it off of the player and then 
in the meantime, force everyone into hating the player, right? Because that's all you can see, but it's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm not a hater. I think it's awesome. I think it's high level hoops and I think it's a compelling story and it's going to be one that you can't miss on Monday. I, I will be watching and this is so random, but you want to take a guess, uh, who the Dallas Wings first preseason game is against coming up this summer? Any guess at all? I have no idea. The Indiana Fever, Ted, would you like to guess what draft pick the Indiana Fever have in the WNBA draft? My guess is they select number one. They do select number one, meaning which Caitlin Clark's first Preseason WNBA game. Her first WNBA action will be against the Dallas Wings in Dallas. Now, I didn't... I Which just we're going to be out of town for. Dang it. Uh, well, that's going to be awesome. Now, I didn't... I just saw the headline as I was scrolling. and didn't click on it, read anything. But did I see something about an offer to play in the big three? Yeah, I saw that. Her? What, $5 million from Ice Is that Cube? what it was? That's pretty big. I I didn't know what it was. I didn't even click on it. it. Just said Caitlin Clark gets offered to play in the big three. I which I interesting. I think Dave Portnoy from Barstool offered her ten to play on some Barstool intramural team or something like that. <laughs> nice. So I she she's gonna make a lot of money playing basketball and a lot of money in endorsements. I I think Caitlin Clark's Clark's gonna be just fine. She's Good she's gonna be just fine for her birthday shout outs. Happy 30th birthday to Austin Farco. And happy birthday to the all-time Oklahoma intramural leading passer, Wyatt Mondo Hassan. Wow. Okay. I like that. Mondo, is that a real middle name? I don't know. I'm guessing. And also... Hassan or Hassan? I don't know. H A S S O N. Not sure I've ever seen that last name. Hassan. 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 I don't know. Wyatt Hassan. Why got to be Hassan. one of the other ones. Yeah. Well, congrats on uh, breaking the record for the intramural passing numbers. It's big time. Do we have real stats on that? I don't know. No, Is, but you know, we'll, sometimes we'll call when him. you know, you know, right? Yeah. When, when you know the guy's the guy. You remember Mondo? Dude Forever. Could, dude could sling it. Uh, Good stuff. On that note, episode 409 in the books. We'll have another episode that'll drop on Wednesday. Shane Beamer, ladies yes. and gentlemen, our guy, will be here to talk some Gamecocks football. We play them this year. We're going to get all the secrets. I know. This interview is going to take a turn. We'll see what his demeanor's like. What happens if he's just really mean to us? <laughs> That'd be so funny. <laughs> it would be odd. Uh, just a reminder, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Hope you all have a great start to your week. And until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do we always do Oklahoma? Take care of each other.